Well, today we're starting a new series. It's called The Voice. How many of you have seen the TV program The Voice? You know what it's about? There, there are men and women who come out and they sing their hearts off in a certain style of music and a certain song they've selected, and they sing it to four judges. But the trick is that four judges have turned their backs to the singers. They're sitting in chairs that are facing the opposite direction. And as they listen to the voice, they determine whether this is a voice that has potential, a voice they want to invest in and help train. And if it is, they'll slam their hand on a button, their chair will spin around, and they'll look at the person singing, and there'll be this, uh, this affirmation exchange there, and sometimes one person turns around or two, or sometimes all four judges turn around. But you know what's really um, agonizing is when nobody's turning around. And they cut away to the family that's in a side room, and they're crossing fingers, or they're praying. And I'm on my chair squirming a little bit, saying that's the most awful feeling in the world. Sing your heart out, and nobody thinks you're worth investing in. And you know, voices have power. Voices have power to move us. They, they move us emotionally, but they also move us directionally. Voices take you down a path. And I know this because there have been voices in my life and voices in your life that have done that. I'm a big Chicago Cubs fan. This is their year. This is their year. We've waited a long time for this. There's a gentleman on their team who's a backup catcher. Not a very good hitter. But they say he's invaluable in the clubhouse for one reason. He creates an atmosphere in which guys end up playing better. And it was said of him in a recent news article, he says he makes our guys better. He knows how to go about pushing buttons with certain guys and getting the best out of them. I know that's true with me. He knows how to say the right things. And you and I have people in our lives who know how to push our buttons in a good way. They say the right thing that builds up confidence and hope and courage to do something. It could be a coach. could have been a, a teacher, a parent, a friend, or a boss in your life that has done that. But at the same time, you've had people push the other button, the button that discouraged you, the button that said you were no good, that you were a failure, that you'd never amount to anything, that you're hopeless, and it created fear and anxiety within you. And there are those people who do that in their lives too. In fact, I would say that all of us have been impacted by the words of people profoundly in our lives. And here's a truth you need to know. The voice you trust directs the path you take. The voice you trust directs the path you take. That voice you listen to and believe will influence your decisions, your steps in your life, and take you to a place, to the place you are now. Some of you are in a very good place. Right now, you're in a very good place because of the words spoken to you. Someone pushed the right buttons. Some of you are in a very bad place right now. Some of you don't like where you are right now. And I can probably trace that back to the words you believed. So we're going to look at some voices today. We're going to look at voices and the power they have. But before we, we do that, I want you to know that over the next few weeks, today and then the next four weeks, we're going to approach a topic that I think some, for some of you may be the most significant topic we've ever discussed in this church that you're going to learn some habits and some tools that you can use that will profoundly impact your Christian walk. And so I urge you not to miss a week. I urge you to pay a lot of attention. I just urge you to apply the steps that we take because it'll take you down a path, a path you really want to go on if you listen to the right voice. And so I want to do that right now. Just tune into the right voice. Uh, just get our hearts in a good place. And before we read our scripture from Matthew 16 to pray that God would speak to us today. So, Father, we invite you right now to speak into our hearts through your Holy Spirit, to put your laser focus on what's going on inside, and, Father, that we would clear away the clutter and listen to you and follow you and let you direct our paths. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 16, we come to a point in Jesus' life where he's been ministering, and he, he's reached a place where he's going to put his disciples on the spot. Because he's, he's performed miracles, he's done teachings, he's done all kinds of things. He wants to know what they think. So, starting with verse 13 of Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Well, what about you? He asked. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. Now on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. 
From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside, and he began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I think this is a very profound passage because what we find in this section of Scripture is Peter is informed by the Heavenly Father of who Jesus truly is, his identity. He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He didn't come up with that on his own. Jesus said, my Father told you that. But then just a few verses later, Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be turned over to the leaders. I'll, I'll suffer many things. I'll be killed, and then I'll be raised to life. And Peter says, no, 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 that's not going to happen. And, uh, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. In other words, Peter, what you just said was what Satan put in your head to oppose the work of God. Peter went from this hero to a zero, from the, from the cheerleader of the Messiah to the biggest challenger of the Christ. All in the moment of just a, a, a few days, possibly. Is it possible that Peter had two voices speaking powerfully to him? The voice of a father in heaven, the voice of an evil one. And if Peter, someone who walked that closely with Jesus, could have those two voices pounding down on him, could it be that you and I, even those of us who are Christians, could be hearing two different voices that are influencing us greatly? I think so. So I want to talk to you about that. There are many voices in our lives, but there are two voices continually calling for my attention. The first is God. Scripture calls him the father of lights. He's your maker, your creator. He wired you and me to communicate with God. We can talk to God. That's called prayer, but we can also listen to God. I'm amazed at children who get this. They seem to just be born with this ability to tune into God, and they, they can talk to God, and it seems like they, they listen to God, have a familiarity with God that sometimes we're jealous of. But over the course of time, we learn to tune into other channels. We start to lose touch with the voice of God. But God made us that way. And in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, there's a description of our Heavenly Father. It says, don't, <clears throat> excuse me, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift comes from who? The Father of lights. Father of lights. The Father who's in the light, who's in the open, who's truthful, honest with us, Good and perfect things come from him. But he says, don't be deceived. There is a deceiver, and we'll talk about him in a minute. There's someone trying to deceive you, but trust in your heavenly Father. He speaks what is good. He wants good for your life. He wants to take you down a path. He's the shepherd that speaks, and the sheep listen, and they follow. He wants to lead us into green pastures beside still waters. That's his desire for us. And God speaks in a number of different ways, but the three biggest ways in which God speaks to us are first through creation, we won't read these scriptures that in your bulletin for the sake of time, but he speaks to us through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day they pour forth speech. There is not a place on this planet where his voice is not heard. And you see it when you look at the mountains, when you see the sky, when you see the storm. You recognize God's powerful and beautiful and good. And then when the sun goes down, the stars say, we'll take it from here. He's glorious. He's majestic. He's beautiful. He's vast. He's great and awesome. So creation speaks of God. The, the clearest way God speaks is through this book called the Bible. It's actually even called the Word of God because it contains the words of God, either directly from God as he gave them to someone or someone wrote as God led them, but this is called the Word of God because it speaks the truth of God. There is no more clear enunciation of God's will for our lives than in this book. Everything else is measured against the standards of Scripture. We always take everything we, we hear. People say, well, God said this, God said that. Well, does it line up with the clear revelation of Scripture? But there's another way in which God speaks, and that's the Holy Spirit. Jesus says when he comes, he will speak. He will remind you of things. He will teach you. He's a talking spirit. And so he speaks within us. He prompts us. He guides us. But everything he says to us lines up with the truth of Scripture. My experience has been most of what the Holy Spirit says to me is a remembrance of what Jesus had said or what, the, what God has said in Scripture. And so those three voices are very strong. 
from God. And there's other ways God speaks too, but those are the three main ones, through creation, through the Bible, and through the Holy Spirit. God is speaking, but someone else is speaking. Satan, the father of lies. Listen to what Jesus said about him in John chapter 8. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He is a murderer from the beginning. We see that at the very beginning of time. He wants to sever a person's relationship with God. Spiritual murder. Cut someone off from God. He, he wants to sever your relationship with your spouse, with your kids, with your friends, with your church, with people. That's what Satan's about. Causing division, causing separation, bringing death. He's a murderer from the beginning. He wants to come and destroy and kill. And ultimately, see the body die and be lost forever in eternity. So that's Satan's, um, that's Satan's goal, but his methodology is through lying. It is his native tongue. He doesn't even have to learn it. It's just him. When he speaks, he speaks with a forked tongue. And so Satan is a liar, and he kills us through deception. It would be nice if it was just bold-faced lies, but I find that Satan is trickier than that. He likes to do counterfeits. You know, a counterfeit is very close to the original. And I find that when Satan lies, he likes to shade the truth a little bit. So it's believable, it's digestible, it makes sense to some degree. For example, in our culture, here's a, to me, this is a perfect example of how Satan does it. For the last 40 years, he's persuaded us to believe that this little thing growing inside of a pregnant woman that we would call a baby is not really a baby. It's not really a person. It's just a lump of tissue. And because it's a lump of tissue, it's not a person, doesn't have feelings, doesn't have dreams. And this little thing growing inside is, is like a gallbladder, and you can actually just take it out and move on with your life. And so we have a whole culture who believes that that's an acceptable practice when in reality, it is the murder of a child. Because I've never, ever heard a woman who's pregnant call this her fetus. She calls it her baby. She calls it her little boy, her little girl. Why is it acceptable in our culture to, to violently kill that little boy or girl? And for most of us, we become so numb to it, it doesn't even bother us anymore. That's Satan. That's what he does. He, he tells us, a woman has a right. She's ultimately in charge. She can, she can do whatever she wants, and that's not a person. That's just, that's just cells. It doesn't become a person until it leaves the womb. Really? I thought in the mother's womb, Scripture says, you are beautifully and wonderfully made. The, the maker knows you as a person. We find this deceptive practice in the very beginning of the Garden of Eden. Um, Genesis chapter 3 it says, The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He, he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. <sighs> you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, Satan comes along, and first thing he says to Eve is, did God really say that? Really? Is that really what God said? And she said, yeah. It's really what he said. He said, don't eat. eat. Eat from everything else but that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, you shouldn't even touch it. Well, I don't know if God said don't touch it, but he said don't eat of it. He says, you know why he said that, don't you? Because if you eat from that tree, you'll see things as God sees them, and you'll become like God. See, if you break his commandment, it won't separate you from God. It'll actually bring you closer to God. Think about that, Eve. And it worked. She and Adam ate the lie. And we're forever living the consequences of that. We now wear clothes to church, thank you, Adam and Eve, because of, <laughs> because of their sin. We are no longer naked and unafraid. We're clothed and afraid. Two voices speaking constantly each vying for our attention, but get this, desiring to take us down opposite paths. They're taking us in opposite directions. So here's, here's a truth you need to know. You can't stop the voices from speaking, 
but you can choose the one you listen to. How many of you have satellite TV? Any of you? Raise your hand. Hi. Raise your hand. Satellite TV. A few of you do. Come on. There's more than that. The rest of you are settlers? <laughs> Cable? Okay. We, we, have, we, have, we have direct TV. And, and there's like hundreds of channels. And some days when we're just kind of killing time, we go down and go, waste, 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 waste. I mean, there's endless news shows. There are infomercials. There's uh, reruns of sitcoms. Um, old episodes of talk shows. There are, there are live sporting events. There are recorded sporting events from years ago. There's documentaries. There's nature shows. You can, you can watch sermons every hour of every day if you want, if you're sick. But, I mean, really, we, we can be bombarded with constant information on the TVs. Every channel is continually broadcasting all the time. But you hold the power in your hand with the remote of choosing the channel you will listen to. If any, right there, you choose. That's the power God has given us. Not to shut the voices off, because they're going to talk. God's always talking. Nature's always talking. That's always going on. Satan's always talking. Satan's always lying. That's always going on. But you and I get to choose, am I going to listen? And if so, which one am I going to listen to? That's the power he gives you and me. And I'm telling you this, that, that God wants you to hear his voice. Because he wants to take you down a path of blessing. In the book of Isaiah, is a little verse, I think it's a powerful verse, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. That's the theme of VBS this year, walk this way. This is the way, walk in it. And you hear that. And when you hear that voice, it's taking you down a path of greater faith often a path of greater sacrifice, a path that will bless other people. And you kind of know that must be God telling me because who else would want me to do that kind of thing? Who, who else would ask me to be that generous or that sacrificial but God? So God wants to take us down this path. But as soon as God speaks to you, as soon as God whispers a truth to you, as, as soon as God directs you in a path, there is another voice that begins to roar. The Bible says Satan is like a roaring lion, and he begins to shout out to you. So, for example, at the end of a church service, when we give an invitation to come forward for, for prayer or, or to give your life to Christ, to surrender, what a beautiful thing. You feel prompted. I think God's wanting me to go forward and surrender my life to Christ. And then this voice says, no, not today. Today's not a good day. Today's really not a good day. You don't have to do that in front of everybody, really. That's going to be embarrassing to go in front of everybody and humble yourself and say you need a Savior. Really, don't, don't do that. Or you're prompted to forgive someone. You know, God's put in your heart that you need to forgive someone that offended you. You go, man, I need to let that thing go. And then this voice says, oh, no, no, not so quick. That's pretty bad what they did to you. And they should come and apologize to you. They, they owe you something. Don't let that thing go. Hold on to that. You, you deserve a payment back from them. You, you get um, compelled to give. Maybe to give generously to someone in need or to the church or give of your time. And then this voice tells you, you can't afford to do that. that that's, that's for you. You earn that. You know, other people should, should work as hard as you do. I mean, but you need to protect the time and the money and all your possessions. That's yours. You've got to protect it because someday you may not have it. Some of you may have been prompted today to work with our kids through the summer, maybe a vacation Bible school, and immediately... This voice starts whispering to you, you don't have time for that. You don't have time for that. Or you're, not, you're not mature enough in your spiritual growth to teach other people the Bible. I mean, you're pretty new to the church. I mean, all these lies start to emerge as soon as God speaks um, direction to us. You know, the devil's greatest victory is not through demons, it's through deception. And when you follow the path of God, you'll often find that there's this gap of information. Like, God's telling me to do this. I don't know where it's going to lead. I don't know what will happen when I do it, but I just believe God's calling me. And it's that gap of information, the lack of knowledge, where Satan often gets in there and says, you can't do that. It'll never work out. Why bother? I mean, who are you? And yet, I do know this. That God doesn't give answers as much as arrows. What God does is, he doesn't give all the information. He just says this way, this way. Abraham, start walking to this place. 
And Abraham probably thought, oh, God, what's going to happen between now and then? I'm not going to tell you that. I just want you to start walking that way. Start going that direction. Saul, you're now Paul. I want you to start walking this way. Well, what's that going to be like? I'll tell you when we get there. Just start walking, living this way. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is a verse that I latched on to when I was in high school. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on what? Your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. That last part of that verse, another version, say, and he will direct your paths. So trust in the Lord even when you don't understand it. That's what faith is. I don't have all the answers, but I know God is calling me. I'm going to step out and trust him. That's what God's calling us to do, what God wants us to do. We choose to believe the voice of God. But what do I do with this other voice? What do I do with the whispers of Satan that enter my mind and head? You demolish them by standing on the truth. Demolish them by standing on the truth. When Jesus explained to Peter what was about to happen to him, Peter did something I think is pretty audacious. He actually pulled Jesus aside, and it says he rebuked Jesus. Can you imagine the gall? Hey, Jesus, Jesus, miracle worker, uh, the, the guy who turns water into wine, calms the storms, casts out demons. You're wrong on this one, okay? That thing about going to suffer, the thing about going on a cross, all, ain't gonna happen. Not on my watch. Got my trusty sword right here, and I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, you have no clue what God's plan is. Get behind me, Satan. The words you're listening to come from the evil one. Get out of here, Satan. And so he drove him away. You know, in the, in the Old Testament, the, again, the book of Isaiah, God says, no weapon forged against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. The weapons of the evil one are not physical. They're typically verbal. It, it's, a, it's a war in the mind. It's a war in our hearts. It's, it's a war over words. What we're believing is true. Because what you believe is true begins to dominate your choices and influence everything because the, the voice you trust directs the path you take. So what do we do with these lies when they emerge? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that although we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments. That's words. And every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. In other words, we're going to use Scripture, the truth of God, to combat the lives of the evil one, not just to disbelieve them, but to demolish them, to crush them, to, to just d destroy them, that we will never believe in them anymore. And he says we do that by taking them captive to the truth of Christ. And my wife gave me a fantastic gift for Christmas. It was a pair of headphones. Now, these aren't normal headphones. They're not Bose brand, but they're a, a knockoff, cheaper brand, but they're noise-canceling headphones. Now, here's something really amazing. You probably don't know much about the technology for many of you, but most headphones have foam, which that is the, it's called a passive noise reducer. It, the, the foam um, muffles some of the sounds around, and that's how typically headphones work. But these have an extra feature. There's a little switch here. When I flip it over, it turns on a blue light. I don't know if you can see that. But when I put them on, oh, this is amazing. I, I can't hear any of the ambient noise. Ambient noise is like, like when you're on an airplane and you, put, you might put those little buds in your ears and all of a sudden, while you're listening to your music or your podcast or the, the movie that's playing, you'll, he you'll, you'll hear this as well. <laughs> it's, it's the engine and you can't block it out. The miracle of these things is this. They're electronic because they're, they, they have power. They have power to, to listen. There's a little microphone in here. Listens to the incoming ambient noise, creates a sound wave of the same frequency and the same amplitude, but 180 degrees opposite, and it shoots it out. And so what happens is this wave that's coming out from the headphones hits the waves that are coming in, and they crash, and they disappear. It, it's, it's called noise canceling. It's an amazing technology. And I love the fact that this is, these aren't just passive headphones. They're active. They're sending a signal out to crash and demolish the sound waves. And I think it's a great picture of what God is telling us to do in our lives. 
Don't just let the, 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 the waves come in and say, I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to try to muffle it and block it out. Say, I'm going to actually go against it with something that's 180 degrees opposite. I'm going to go against it with the truth. And we see this perfectly in the life of Jesus. Look at Jesus when he's in the desert being tempted by Satan. Now, you can read the story. I just want to show you three verses in that story from Matthew chapter 4. Satan tells Jesus, who's fasting for these 40 days, and he comes to him and says, turn those stones into bread. And so, so Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then we see Satan taking him to the top of the temple. He's at a very high point, and, and uh, Satan says, jump off, because Scripture says the angels will, will protect you. You won't get hurt. And again, in verse 7, Jesus said, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then Satan takes him to a high mountain. He looks over all the kingdoms of the earth and says, if you bow down and worship me, all these are yours. I'll give them all to you. And Jesus again, verse 10, says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Do you notice a pattern? Every time Satan spoke to him, every time Satan tried to distort some things or mislead him, Jesus responded with three words. It is written. In other words, what Jesus was saying is, that's not what God says. You say this, but that's not what God says. You say I should turn this into, these stones into bread and then I have a right to do it because I'm hungry and all that, but that's not what God says. And you and I need to practice an offensive strategy to go against the evil one with the truth of Scripture. And so what I want you to do right now is I'm going to ask you to stand. And we're going to do some practice. We're going to practice a little bit how to do some spiritual battle to win this war of words. Uh, I want you to say with me, this phrase, that's not what God says. Okay, let's try it. That's not what God says. Okay, I'm going to give you a, a lie of the evil one, and I want you to respond in unison with that chorus. That's not what God says. You're, you're too unworthy. You're too dirty. You're too messy. God could never forgive you. That's not what God says. Does, does God can never hear your prayers because you're, you're a nobody. It's not what God says. Your marriage is so broken it can never be fixed. You can't step out and do that, that thing God's calling you to do because, because you don't have the skills. You don't have the reputation. You don't have the ability to do that. That's not what God says. Your, your little contribution, your little gift of sacrifice, that's, that's so piddly, that's so meaningless, it won't make any difference in anybody's life. That's not what God says. You don't have to go repair that thing that was broken. Just forget about it. It'll go away. That addiction that's taken hold of you, that addiction that's had power of you, quit fighting it, give in to it. You're a victim. Give up. God will never hear your prayers because he doesn't care for you. He doesn't really love you. See, you've got you to fight the lies with the truth, and you've got to know the truth. So here's what some of us need to do this week. If you don't have a habit of opening up this book, and make a commitment to read a chapter a day, to take a book. And if you're new to reading Scripture, I just want to encourage you, maybe take the book of John or Philippians or James, a book that's pretty easy to follow, and just commit to reading a chapter a day. And as you read it, even before you read it, say, God, speak to me. Help me to know your truth and to stand on your truth. I want to know your will for my life. Because if you don't take in God's word, you have no resources to do battle against the lies of the evil one. This book is called the sword of the spirit, the word of God. That is our offensive weapon to cancel out the lies of the evil one. That's called uh, destructive interference. That's what we want to do. And some of you uh, need to celebrate that today. And some of you need to rejoice in that today. Some of you need to commit to that today. And as we sing this next song that celebrates the victory we have because God is on our side, some of you have been wounded by the lies you've believed. You're in the place you are right now because Satan has whispered something and you bought it. Maybe you did something that, that you're ashamed of. Maybe you're feeling something that, that is wrong. Maybe Satan has whispered something and deep inside you say, I know that's not true, but I hear it so often. I've even had other people confirm it, but that's not what God says. I want to invite you to come up for prayer, and, and I'd like even our prayer partners to come up right now and be available, because maybe what you just need today is someone to pray truth over you, to remind you of who you are to God. Because at the end of the day, what matters most is this, that the voice you trust directs the path you take.